Okay. Okay, good. So um, can you guys see the full screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, good, good. All right. Uh, well, good to see you all there in uh, Egypt. It sounds like a great workshop and um, uh, you've got some big buddies of mine, uh, Fernando and Pedro there, I think it's somewhere in the background, I don't know. Um, so you've got an interesting, great week ahead with uh, lots of uh, exciting speakers. Um, and I think it's kind of uh, an honor for me to be, be able to present um, probably what I would say is one of the most interesting and important um, attempts at some sort of a general theory of what's going on in the brain from an algorithmic perspective. Um, uh, the Bayesian brain, predictive processing, active inference, and the free energy principle. Uh, so, um, you know, I can see you guys all there. Um, I wonder if, if by a show of hands, I could like anyone could put up their hand if they feel like uh, they they um, have a have a grip on the free energy principle and active inference. Anyone put put up their hand? Uh, can't quite see. Have, have, oh, have, okay, have, how about have, 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 how about something easier like? Anyone like familiar with the kind of basic Bayesian brain hypothesis? Okay, so you know a few. So okay, we'll we'll okay, we'll look. We're gonna go at it slowly. Um, and I assume that like most people have a kind of a mathematical background, so so that's gonna make it um, a little easier. So we'll start from um, philosophy, and you know the basic uh, the basic place we start is from the nature of perception. So, you know, I'm outside, I'm looking at a tree and um, I kind of just see a tree and it's just amazing. Um, but we are thinking, well, somehow um, I form some sort of a representation of that tree in my mind. And, um, and of course, what we what we begin to understand is that actually, if I've always perceiving just the representation of the tree in my mind, then I'm not really perceiving the tree as it is in itself. You know, that's a sort of philosophical issue. Um, and also, the other thing that I must be doing is I'm also forming a representation of myself, and that is so uh, in our in our mind's eye. You know, we're we're also forming some sort of um, representation of ourselves. And it's a big issue in philosophy how this works. And, you know, one of the first great philosophers to really uh, start to nail this is um, Immanuel Kant um, uh, in the um, 18th century. And what he showed is that, look, um, we only experience the phenomenal world, the, world, the things as they appear to us. And we have to, when we use the categories of space and time and causality to arrange our perceptual framework. And these kind of things like space, time, causality are kind of hyper priors that we bring to bear to organize our sensory appearance, our sensory data. And what he called it is that he thought that he had created some sort of Copernican revolution in, uh, in, the, in the mind sciences in the sense that he said, look, it's objects that must conform to our cognition rather than cognition conforming to objects. And this was a huge insight. And, um, you know, about a hundred years later, um, Helmholtz, a very famous physicist and psychologist, um, started to crystallize this as perception as inference. And this is really where, um, where, where, the, where the free energy principle and, um, uh, predictive processing start with. When we look out from our eyes, unlike what uh, sort of Descartes, the typical view that uh, Descartes might have helped, we are not just passively um, experiencing what's coming through our eyes. 
Um, perception is kind of hard. Um, if you look at this video, what, what you see is roughly speaking, what we might see in accurately, if you could actually see what's coming through your eyes, because all that we can perceive through our eyes is a very, very small central area of the, of the macula, the fovea. Um, and it's very difficult to see what's going on. And by the way, you know, most of it's in black and white, only the central part is in color. So if we actually see what I was, what you're actually seeing, um, now you can see much clearer that, you know, you're perceiving this bee um, um, buzzing around a, a flower. Now, it's very difficult to make sense of the, the dot on the left, uh, but somehow our brain constructs a whole image. Now, how is that done? Um, that is done, that is called the Bayesian perception problem. And the basic problem is this, we receive some sort of, that, you know, that we're assuming that there is something out there in the world, which are the causes of our perception. Actually, according to Kant, we can't really say much about this at all, but what we do get is sensory data. So you is some sort of um, large vector of uh, sensory data. And the problem for the agent is that we have to form something called the recognition density, which is the probability probability distribution of, of like, what are the causes of my sensory data given my sensory data? What are the causes of my sensations given my sensory data? Now that, of course, is um, solved by using um, Bayes' theorem. Um, and Bayes' theorem, as you as you know, this, this, this term here, what we're trying to solve for is the posterior, the probability of the sensory data, of the um, causes of my sensations given my sensory data. And to solve that, we have to use two terms as well as a normalizing term underneath here. Um, we start with our prior probability of what do we, before receiving any data, what do we expect um, the, what are our background prior beliefs around the uh, causes of, this, of, of these features in the world, that there are trees in the world, for example, and there are agents. And then the second term is the likelihood of the data. What is the probability of getting this particular sensory data given that it comes from my best guess, which is a tree? So in other words, how likely am I to, re to receive these particular sensations given that there's a tree out there, my hypothesis of what's going on? And underneath is the probability of receiving this sensory data in the first place, which is a kind of normalizing term. Now that normalizing term actually is, is very difficult to compute. It's an infinite integral. You basically have to go through every single hypothesis of, you know, this sensory data could be caused by a tree, it could be caused by a mountain, it could be caused by, um, you know, some sort of hallucination, you know, you couldn't possibly do it. It's computation explosive. So although Bayes' theorem is the mathematically optimal solution that maximizes the value of all information. It is absolutely the correct mathematical solution. We cannot solve it. We cannot solve it using machine learning because it's computationally explosive and evolution cannot solve it. Our biological beings cannot solve it explicitly. So how do we get around it? Well, we can draw inspiration from machine learning techniques like um, artificial neural networks. Um, so artificial neural networks, um, you know, train on, on whole loads of, of uh, sensory data. So whole loads of data, for example, this particular neuro neuron could train on a whole load of faces. And as it learns, as we adjust these synaptic weights, it starts to do something called feature extraction. So at low levels of the sensory data, uh, at the low levels of the uh, a neural network, it extracts low level features like edge, oops, sorry, edges and corners and little things like this, low level features. At mid levels of the network, it's extracting mid level features like noses and eyes and ears. And then at high level um, areas, it extracts the high level features like um, whole faces, for example. 
But the question is, you know, how do these networks tra train? These networks um, uh, train essentially by being provided some ground truth sensory data. So what we do is go through something called supervised learning. OK, so the way supervised learning works is that we really know what a true face is. You're given all these thousands of examples of true faces. And then what happens is that we, we, we get a new face, of sensory data, um, and um, we, we take a guess. This network has not yet trained. It takes a guess at what this is. This could be a, a cat or a, or a dog or a face. And what we know is, is, is whatever, this, um, whatever this image is, it could be, as I said, um, you know, anything, a cat or, or, or a dog or a face, um, we actually know the true category. Um, it could, it's an actually a face. And so we can compare the guess of the neural network with the ground truth, the true features. And that sets up a prediction error. And we use that prediction error signal, or generally we square it, uh, uh, because then the derivative is uh, very simple. And we we basically, you know, um, apply multivariate calculus to minimize the prediction error and adjust all these synaptic weights so that the error is is minimized. And and step by step, the the neural the neurons start learning. That's a very famous algorithm called the backpropagation algorithm. Now the problem with that is that there is no supervisor in the brain. Who is giving us the ground truth data? Who is saying, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a face? There isn't anyone. Even if you're told as a child, you know, this is a cat two or three times, that's simply not enough data to kind of do uh, supervised learning. So somehow the brain must be doing this in an unsupervised way. So how might we be doing that? Well, there's only one thing we know. OK, we don't know the ground truth. The only one thing we know is the data itself. And so if we have to guess, if we only know the data itself and we're trying to guess a feature vector, in other words, what are the features of my experience? Dogs, cats, faces, um, edges, you know, I mean, whatever features there are. What we can do is a brilliant strategy, which is to try to uh, take a get, try to learn this net feature network, and then whatever we guess at, we then say, let me then assume that that's the feature in the of the world. Those are the causes of my sensory data, and let me generate a network going the other way to construct some predicted some predicted data. Let me simulate what I would be seeing if there was a cat and a dog and a face in this picture. And that is, um, and, and then we can um, compare the predicted uh, data that I, the, the predict, what, what, I'm, what I'm guessing are the predictions and the actual sensory data. And that sets up a prediction error. And that is used to train the network. Now this kind of network is called, um, in general, an autoencoder. And uh, there are three parts of the network. The first part is the recognition model or the feed forward model, um, uh, which is which is trying to go from the data to a feature vector, the, the, the code. This gray bar here is called the code. If any of you have heard of predictive coding, well, the code that they're referring to in predictive coding is basically this line here, this series of neurons in the middle here. And then the second part is the generative model. This is generating what I would be seeing um, if this was the correct uh, uh, features of the world. And that second part of the model is called a decoder as well. So the problem is that this kind of network is extremely difficult to train um, because it's very nonlinear. It's very, you know, there are too many possibilities and, and data is ambiguous and difficult to decipher. So um, these kind of networks, especially a type of network that, uh, that called the variational autoencoders are trained using um, 
something called free energy as an objective function rather than just the prediction error. And free energy takes into account the prediction error that we talk, talked about, plus it takes into account priors, prior probability around what you would expect this feature vector to be. All right. Um, and that gives us a, a, a principled way to train the network. Okay. So this kind of network that we just showed in machine learning, we can take inspiration from that. Inspiration. Last week I was with, uh, all week with uh, a whole lot of uh, scientists, including um, uh, Carl Friston, who is who is really one of the, the founders of the free energy principle. In fact, the, the kind of key architect. And he actually warned us about um, kind of trying to use machine learning um, analogies. However, he felt that this particular analogy is a very good one. And so I commend it to you to really think about how the brain is working. So we, we're, we're using this model as a kind of idea of how the brain is working, except that in the brain, what happens is that this top network, can you, this, this green network, this generative model, actually folds back onto the feed forward network. So I don't know if this animation is coming through clearly, but that was supposed to illustrate the network folding back onto itself. And the feed forward network, the blue network, kind of goes up. And in fact, what actually travels up, according to the, the predictive processing framework, is not the data itself, but simply the prediction errors, simply these prediction errors travel up. And what's actually happening is that this generative model is taking a guess from the latent layer, the code, and the feature vector, and generating what I would be seeing. And, and the only thing that's traveling up is the prediction errors compared to this generative model. So this is the fundamental idea of what is going on in predictive processing. Except that this is probably happening in a hierarchical way. We have a number of these kind of models that are going on, organized in sort of layers. And, and then what happens is that these priors are actually arising from higher level models in the brain. Um, and and um, prediction errors actually go up to these higher level models. And priors for this higher level model are coming from even higher level models in the brain. And so there could be maybe, you know, who knows how many layers in this, you know, perhaps half a dozen layers in this kind of hierarchical predictive processing framework. Okay, so let's look at specifically how the variational um, algorithm is supposed to work. Now, as we said, we receive, you know, there are certain features in the world that uh, we're assuming are generating our sensory data, this sensory data. These features in the world are generating our sensory data. And we cannot solve Bayes' theorem correctly. So what we have to do is we have to form an inference. We have to make a guess at an approximate approximate posterior. So we make a functional form often, you know, in these kind of models, they're often assumed to be Gaussian, for example, you know, um, uh, multidimensional Gaussian um, with certain parameters. So this probability distribution has certain parameters phi. And that is instantiated in the example that I gave. It's operationalized in the feed forward network that we talked about, the recognition model, the blue network at the bottom of the autoencoder. And from this approximate posterior, we then have an estimate of the code, this, this red bar here, which is the features, an estimate of the features in the world, that there's a tree, that there's an agent. And from there, we then create, we have a generative model, which in the brain, of course, feeds back um, on itself. And the output of the generative model 
is a is a uh, the sensory data that I would be my expectations of what I would be seeing in the world. In this case, I don't know if you can see this this sort of little tree that sits on top of the generative model. And from there, we then are in a position to compare the predicted data u dash and the actual data, and we get a prediction error. And that is at the heart of trying to train this model. But as I said before, there's one more factor that goes into the free energy, and that is the deviation from my prior expectations. How different are these features from my prior expectations? So for example, um, if it if just using the prediction, you know, if I thought this was an alien spacecraft, um, that had landed, that would have a lot, kind of a low prior probability. And so uh, that would mean that these causes are kind of far away from my prior. And um, that would mean that I would be penalized for thinking it's an alien spacecraft. And using this free energy, which combines both the prediction error and this Kale divergence, which is essentially the distance or some sort of inverted commas distance, it's not actually a metric, um, from my prior expectations, I can then train this, this recognition model and the generative model itself to minimize free energy. And I will hopefully slowly, slowly get a convergence between this approximate posterior and the real posterior, you know, really accurate image of uh, what's going on. And that, in a nutshell, is the variational algorithm to solve approximate Bayesian inference. Now, uh, before we move on, um, again, uh, show of hands, I just, I, I know you're a sort of a mathematical crew, but how many people are familiar with a relative entropy KL divergence? Can someone, can you have a show of hands, please? Okay, I can see maybe two, three. Okay, fine. So this is a, this is really important, and and um, since I understand you're supposed to be like understanding this stuff at a technical basis, so let me let me let me just go through this because this is kind of important. It's very easy. I'm not going to, um, but but this this basic idea is that the KL divergence between two probability distributions is essentially measuring something like a distance, the, you know, how far away are these distributions? How different are these distributions? And the particular form that that, that this functional form has is, is um, you basically compute, um, um, you take uh, uh, this the first probability distribution, uh, P log of P over Q. Okay, and so these are the two distributions you're trying to compare. But what it really means, the take home message that I want you to say is what it really means is how much information, how much information, suppose that I thought that um, a treasure was buried on a straight line, let's say a road uh, going between zero and one, okay, and I have no information, otherwise my, my kind of probability distribution is um, Q of X. I don't know where the treasurer is buried. It could be anywhere along this line. And, and then someone offers me a kind of a more accurate map saying, actually, the treasure is buried between um, 0 0.825, 0 0.825 and 1, right here, P of X. This is a new information that I get a more accurate probability distribution. How much information have I got? How many bits do I get from going from Q of X to P of X? What is the informational distance? And that uh, informational distance is roughly speaking, how many yes, no questions I have, how many bits of information, how many yes, no questions I have to go from Q of X to P of X. And you know, it's kind of easy. I could say, is it on the left of Q of X or the right of Q of X? That's question one. So it's on the right. Okay, 
if it's on the right, is it on the first half or the second half? It's on the second half. Okay, that's the second question. And is it, then I say, is it on the first half or the second half of that? And it's on the second half, so it's P of X. So three questions. So in fact, if I compute this, this uh, sum, and let's just do it like an integral because it's the same thing, um, what I see is um, that I can actually compute that. It's pretty easy integrals like this, this is eight, and then that's log of eight, P of X is, is height of eight because the area under the curve is one and Q of X is one and times one, you know, the area under the curve. And if I compute that, I get exactly three bits because this, this, this integral limits give, gives me one eighth. Okay, so anyway, just wanted to explain that, um, that it's a very simple calculation. It's roughly speaking the informational distance. Now, I, I worry about using the word distance and metric. If you want a real metric, you have to use something called the Fisher information distance. And you integrate this KL divergence, and then you get, you know, you get into the kind of wonderful informational geometry that I'm sure Fernando is going to be talking to you about. So, um, right. As I said, this is not a metric because it's not symmetric, but let's not worry about that. Now, let's get into the real heart of it because you're here to learn about the free energy principle. And I'm only going through this not to kind of uh, do a shock and awe, but actually to say, in fact, how simple this is. You will see as you go through your, you know, as you go through uh, your careers in this whole area that people are bamboozled by all the mathematics around the free energy principle. And actually it's relatively easy to, to do, but um, it's couched in very technical uh, tensor calculus. Okay. And it's kind of difficult to unravel. So I hope you will uh, later on come back and say, oh, well, that was a beautiful explanation that you saw here in Egypt. So the basic idea is, is um, to solve the fundamental problem that we talked about. What are the causes of my sensory data? And, and we're going to use Bayes' theorem. But as we just saw, we cannot use Bayes' theorem directly because it's computation explosive. So we're going to use a variational algorithm. Uh, we're going to approximate the actual posterior that we're trying to learn with we're going to approximate it with this Q of um, uh, this Q distribution, which is, uh, you know, for example, could be a simple form like a Gaussian um, with some parameters, um, multivariate um, uh, uh, distribution. And um, we are going to uh, try to minimize the distance, inverted commas, um, the, technically the KL divergence between Q and P. So we're going to minimize the kullback leibler divergence between the Q distribution and the true posterior P by changing the parameters of the underlying dist Q distribution. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, uh, does this come across this, this equation? Can everyone see it? Yeah? Okay, good. So this says, please minimize um, by changing these parameters of the Q distribution, the KL divergence between P and Q. All right, how do we do that? Well, um, I showed you the functional form of what a KL divergence looks like. This is just the definition of it. All right, that sounds straightforward enough. And we just sum over all the categories V, all the particular features it could be. Uh, in this. Now, you'll immediately recognize that uh, when I sum with a probability in front, that's basically an expectation value, right? So I can basically rewrite that as the expectation of this log of Q over P distribution. Um, so here's the expectation under the Q measure. Um, this is a measure, probability measure under the Q uh, probability measure, it's, it's this distance. Now, of course, I just put a minus sign instead of dividing because that's just a property of logs, okay? You can separate out the logs in this way, very simple. And then we're just going to use Bayes' theorem because what we recognize is, look, this is the probability of, of the features given my data. And that is here 
on this side, that is just the posterior. Well, if I take logs of this posterior here, then I get a log in front on this side. And of course, when I multiply um, things, the logs add. And when I divide the, the logs, uh, you subtract. So essentially this here, which is the posterior, the, lo the, the log of the posterior simply becomes this, which in these, these are just the terms, the likelihood of the data. That's the term, that's this term here. This is the prior, the log of the prior. And this is the log of the uh, probability of the data, the normalizing term. Okay, so this is just applying Bayes' theorem. And then we just rewrite this in very simple terms. We simply take the prior and put it in with the first term. And then we separate out the other two terms, okay? And what we then have, a simple rewriting, is we recognize that the first term here is nothing but another KL divergence of this form except that what we have is a KL divergence between the approximate posterior, this, 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 um, this Q distribution, and the prior probability of V, okay? And then these terms here are simply the expected value under the Q uh, measure of the, um, log probability of the sensory data of the likelihood of the data and then this term here this term here i can take out of the by the way i could take out of the expectation operator because it doesn't depend on uh q at all right so there's you know there's nothing stochastic here so i can just take it out and then finally so we can notice that it's a constant now these first two terms are the free energy okay um, this first term here, um, the KL divergence, and then the second term, the um, the expected uh, surprise. I'm going to come on to see why, why that's called surprise. So this term here is roughly speaking, how surprising is the sensory data? What is the expected surprise of this of this data? given that I'm assuming, that given this feature, given that I think it's a tree, how surprising is the sensory data? So if you, if you look, it's a negative log. If you remember, logs go from minus infinity to zero. So if we put a negative sign, it goes from plus infinity all the way down to, to zero. And um, if you have, um, if, the, if it's very, very surprising, if it's not very surprising at all, in other words, this is precisely the kind of sensory data that I would expect, given that it's a tree, it's not very surprising. Um, it's, got a, it's got a low, it's got a high probability of being this kind of sensory data, given that it's a tree, then it's not very surprising. If for an, on, on the other hand, it's like really unsurprising, you know, I'm seeing, something that is more like uh, uh, snakes and crocodiles, then um, it's very surprising data. And so this term would be highly surprising. So the first term in, in this term in the free energy is surprise. How surprising is my sensory data? In other words, how good a fit is this explanation for the data? The second term, and this the first leading term here, is the KL divergence between the um, uh, between the uh, the the posterior that I've that I've learned and the prior. So take a look at this furry animal here. It could be actually. Let's suppose that it's equally likely to be a dog, a cute little furry dog um, with blonde hair or a polar bear, okay? In other words, let's suppose that the surprise of the sensory data, given that it's a polar bear, is equal to the surprise that it's, that it's a dog. In other, words, they, the, in other words, the data fits both the dog model and the polar bear model. But polar bears, especially walking around in Egypt, um, are 
very unlikely. The prior probability of seeing a polar bear in Egypt is very low. And so this term would be a very high distance between the posterior that is a polar bear and, uh, and the prior that is a polar bear. So you'd be very much penalized. Remember, we're trying to minimize free energy here. Okay. So these are the two terms of, of uh, free energy. Now, I'm sure you're probably asking, and no one ever explains in, in, in uh, neuroscience, why is this called free energy? I mean, I, I thought the free energy was something to do with entropy and energy and like stuff like that, you know, jewels. You know, this is information. This is not jewels. Well, it's called the free energy because you can rewrite this term. I won't explain how. This is very easy to rewrite this from, from this line here into a slightly different format. And you can check it for yourself that it's uh, possible to do this. And this happens to be, this way of rewriting this free energy term here happens to be equal to exact, I mean, isomorphic with the Helmholtz free energy in thermodynamics, okay? And the reason for that is because this term here is the average energy. Um, you remember, you, when you sum up and multiply by probability, uh, this, this thing here, which, which is going to turn out to be the energy of the explanation, that's the average energy. And this is the entropy, minus log P log, uh, 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 P log P, some is the entropy okay so here's the end so energy minus entropy or average energy minus entropy if, as you might recognize is the typical form of a free energy and and then you might say well why on earth is this an energy this is an energy if you you know for those of you um, remember uh, you know have done physics the Boltzmann distribution in thermodynamics is that the probability is related to the energy by an exponential term. So if I take log of both sides, I get rid of this exponential term. So then the minus sign comes over and hey, presto, minus log P. And that is equal to the energy. So that's called the energy of the explanation, the energy of the explanation that this is a, a tree. So that is the free energy. So there you have it. And now you can forget all about it because you've seen it once in your life. Once you've seen it in your life, it's been demystified and you can say, ah, oh, it wasn't magic after all. So now um, I, I need to move on a little bit faster. So I'm actually just going to, to, to whiz through some of these uh, uh, bits, but, but roughly seeing that um, what this is basically saying is that is that um, there's a very nice approximation and, and uh, of this uh, free energy principle. And the takeaway message is that the posterior belief, the posterior that you're forming is roughly speaking the weighted average of your priors and your sensory evidence, your priors and the sensory evidence coming from the likelihood. And the, the weights of that weighted average turn out to be the precisions of the distribution. In other words, how, if your precision is inverse variance. In other words, if your prior is particularly sharply focused, you know, low standard deviation, then it's going to be highly weighted within the posterior. Or if you get very accurate data, okay, you're going to um, highly weighted within your posterior. Okay. Um, all right, so now, so we've got this basic hierarchical model and these precisions that we talked about, uh, how sharply uh, influenced are gonna influence the, in, the top-down ratings, top-down weighting of the priors compared to the sensory data. Now, in the brain, we've got a kind of cortical hierarchy and that is, the, 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 the hierarchy that I'm talking about in the, in the um, uh, hierarchical predictive processing framework is precisely going to be that um, uh, it's it's a homologue of the hierarchy in in the cortex, and this is a very nice uh, machine learning um, exercise that was done to try to figure out the cortical hierarchy and. 
you know, very similar, uh, uh, similar things to, to, to what one might imagine, you know, low level sensory percepts are low level features, mid level features like motion and uh, rotation and faces. And then at the right at the top of the cortical hierarchy are language and concepts and reasoning, as you might expect. And of course, this hierarchy is probably best not represented as a as a pyramid structure but in fact from a hierarchical from a predictive processing point of view it's really seen as these these different channels of um, streams of hierarchical predictive processing models until they start integrating together perhaps in some sort of a global workspace or something that you might learn about. Of course, no one has put together predictive processing and global workspace theory as yet. People have tried to attempt to do that, but I'm just kind of warming you up and making you salivate to say that, ah, you know, maybe these things could fit together in some way. You know, you have these uh, predictive processing models of vision, audition, the motor system actually goes outwards, olfaction, somatosensory, interception, gustation, uh, the whole visceral proprioception, um, and they kind of come together. Now, actually, we're probably not going to have time to go through the phenomenal self model, but it's super interesting that, in fact, the self itself is nothing but an internal model uh, within a predictive processing hierarchy, uh, hierarchical framework. Um, and so the basic upshot is that our conscious experience, to the extent that we're conscious of the generative model, will be the contents of our generative model. That is the take home message at what will become a uh, kind of predictive processing theory of consciousness. As yet, it hasn't been worked out, but if, if it is worked out, um, the, the computational neurophenomenology assumption is that the contents of our generative model is the contents of our of our um, conscious experience to the extent that we're, we're conscious of it. So this, this is not completely worked out because we've got to figure out, well, what are we co conscious of? But in other words, you know, if I'm looking out at the tree, I'm going to have like a represent, you know, a, a, you know, in my generative model, this 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 uh, construction of a tree and a and an avatar, you know, the self avatar and some thoughts, and these thoughts could be visual thoughts and and auditory thoughts, blah blah blah, and um, visceral sensations and and proprioception, um, and uh, smells and uh, sensations of the breath at my nose and my the, the sense of my heartbeat and sounds. And emotions, I can, I, you know, I'm constructing my emotions in, in a sense like uh, as, as Lisa Thelman Barrett has kind of described in this way. And all these contents of the generative model aren't just sitting on top of each other until, unless you're uh, kind of doing psychedelics or in a meditative state, they're organized into a phenomenal self model. So, what does that look like? Well, they are reorganized. I don't know if that that animation came through okay. I'll do it again. Um, they are organized into a subject-object duality. So everything in this blue area here is within a subject. Uh, there are internal interoception. These are extraception. Um, uh, there's a certain perspectivity. There's a subject-object relationship. There's a notion of agency. There's multisensory integration. Um, there's a sense of mindness, a kind of a sense of a Cartesian theater. These are all constructions. Um, and that we're not really aware of the fact that there is this phenomenal self-model, and that's called phenomenal transparency, according to the philosopher Thomas Metzinger. So just to before I finish, just to to to, fin to minimum to, to finish up, because the, the real fruit of this whole free energy principle and predictive processing framework is something absolutely um, amazing, uh, which is that we can put action into the same framework to minimize free energy. And that is called active inference. And to be honest, I think that that's a real, that's the, that's why this framework is so amazing because it kind of unifies action and perception in a single framework. 
And Carl Friston came up with, with this kind of idea in the, in the um, maybe around 2008 and nine. Um, and, and the way it works is that essentially, you, the way you can put it is that the goal states, let's say I'm trying to reach over to grab an apple, um, uh, you know, and the apple is here in green, if you can see, and I'm currently here. Well, if the way it sets up is it puts that getting the apple is in my prior, I have a prior expectation to get the apple. That's kind of my reward. Goal states are embedded into the priors. And then immediately there's a prediction error between where my finger is at the moment, my hand is at the moment, and where I want it to be getting the apple, right? And so this prediction error will be resolved not by changing my perception, but by moving my muscles. In other words, doing action. Um, and so inference and action are resolved together. And there is a uh, movement trajectory until the prediction error is minimized and I got the apple. Absolutely astounding. So the way, okay, I won't go through this, but this is, this is what you're gonna finally understand later on. And I just don't want you to be mesmerized by this, but this is um, the kind of final active inference framework with action in it. And it's typically instantiated in a partially observed Markov decision-making process under active inference. So the way this works is that what we saw before is that I'm trying to predict my, um, my sensory data. These O is the outcomes, the outcomes of my, kind of the, you know, the, the world shows me my sensory data. These, this, is, this is the sensory data. And I'm trying to model the world. And that's these states. These are internal models of the world and these matrices, uh, which, which are probability transition matrices. Don't worry about the details about these, you know, how these are formed. What I need to do when I bring action in is that I need to have some sort of preferences, some sort of goal stage, which are called preferred um, preferred observations. This is this. Pro th th this is a probability distribution over my preferred outcomes, and that is gives me my my expected free energy, and uh, uh, the expected free energy. And then I have my priors around my habits, uh, you know, which are habitual actions, and a precision weighting over this expected free energy. And that gives me my policies of the world. And the whole thing is minimizing expected free energy. So. <laughs> That is a uh, that's a quick whirlwind tour on um, on this framework. And, uh, we can go to questions now. Okay. Hi, Thank can you, you hear us? Yes, we can. Right. Okay. Good. Can you see me as well? I. Or, uh, yep. I can see. Okay. Cool. So who's got questions? Okay, I saw you first. There you go. Hello. Thank you for the talk. Um, uh, um, the um, machine learning analogy that uh, um, you cite reflect, it like seems to uh, suggest that you're thinking of kind of enter and learning happening in the brain. Or like um like some like other aspects of the free wait, energy wait. principle. Maybe you can you hold it slightly? Can you hear me well? It it goes rather as if you're talking underwater. Um, um can you yeah, I'm stuttering a little bit, but okay. It's this can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, let's start over. Uh, the um the Machine learning analogy you cited with like seem to suggest that your thing of like enter and learning will be happening in the brain, where like um like a, from like other aspects of like free energy principle that I have read about it's um uh, there's also the there's also the, the aspect of hierarchical self organization. Uh, I was wondering maybe if you could comment on if that can be brought together in some sense, or if that's like, or rather those are contradictory views. Okay, yeah, look, 
<clears throat> I think that <clears throat> I think you have um I think you have uh, put your finger on a very important uh, uh, issue, which is that, you know, I don't think we have the grand, well, first of all, take the machine learning analogy as simply pedagogical, pedagogical, right? Uh, uh, this is really to introduce and make, try to make sense of the free energy principle. Um, how it's being instantiating in the brain is something we, we really don't have um, good models and and data over yet. Uh, so I think it's a great question, and I think you should uh, think about working on that. <laughs> yes, thank you. Other questions? Uh, I think that is first. Um, I think you can ask a question. Hi, Shamil. Hey. Uh, good to see you here. Oh, I didn't, I didn't you know you were out there, so great. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so uh, predictive processing is not in itself a theory of consciousness, uh, but clearly it has implications for consciousness. I noticed that you framed most of the discussion in terms of perception rather than consciousness. And it seems like free energy principle in general comments a lot more explicitly on that rather than consciousness. Um, does Carl or anybody else um, who is working on the free energy principle um, explicitly distinguish between perception and consciousness? What is the difference? Right. Can they be treated as the same? Okay, so as I mentioned, the whole of last week, I was at... Um, a workshop with uh, Carl Friston, Anil Seth, Jakob Howey, um, Thomas Metzinger, you know, the, you know, the whole the leaders of this whole area um, on computational neurophenomenology. And that, what you're asking was precisely what we were debating back and forth, uh, you know, and it was very, it was uh, very interesting. So, I would say that, so, you know, we're, we are right at the beginning of, of saying, look, we have our conscious experience and we know that the, and we have the neural going on and we know that the brain must be solving some sort of Bayesian inference problem. So it's a good way of approximating What's going on in the brain is by uh, modeling it as kind of a predictive processing framework. And given that we are trying to, given that um, our phenomenal experience is, you know, if you take a functionalist perspective, our phenomenal experience is somehow um, being worked out in terms of neural goings on. Um, you can then say that the predictive processing model is going to be a homologue of what is going on in the brain, but also what is going on in phenomenology. So we're precisely trying to draw, you're absolutely right to, 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 to ask this question, but we are explicitly say trying to draw uh, an analogy to say yes indeed this is a way that the project of of um computational neurophenomenology is precisely using um uh, active inference frameworks for example or other computational models to model our phenomenal experience and and if you want to drill down further, if you're assuming some sort of active inference framework, then I would even say that that um, parts of the posterior or the posterior is the homologue of what is our conscious experience. And our precision weightings are the homologue of our attention mechanism. In other words, the sort of, you know, if I, if I really pay attention to this um, this bottle of water, then in my posterior, remember the precision weighting is the is 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 the weight that, that that's used as the, to calculate the weighted average in my posterior. So you know this is strongly weighted into my 
into my posterior distribution. In other words, my, my consciousness is deeply in, um, uh, dominated by this bottle. Okay. So great question. You're right at the cutting edge. We don't have a theory of consciousness, which is based around predictive processing. However, what I'm trying to say to you is that it's starting to look very evocative. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Yep. So actually, uh, my question is exactly pretty similar to uh, Ken's question. So actually, I, I've read from a lot of places like, oh, people always predict processing active inference is not really a theory of consciousness, it's just a framework. But at the same time, I got so confused. So for example, I see a lot of adversarial, adversarial collaboration is now trying to test the prediction of predictive processing or active inference between these PBT theories and other theories. So it's a framework or it's a theory. If it's just a framework, then it does not really review, for example, necessary review, for example, in the background, I'm asking why sometimes I see the stimuli and why the other times I do not. Right. Um, yeah, and 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 if this if it is a theory, then it is a theory. Then it's no more a framework. Then it should give an explanation to. So, for example, why backward masking binocular rivalry works. So, guys, you know, uh, guys and girls, what you're seeing here is how science is actually, you know, the the sausage making. There is a, you, you know. There are people, Anil Seth and Jakob Howey have written a paper to say predictive processing is not a theory of consciousness. And then other people like uh, Adam Safran, a couple, uh, just a year you know, ago, kind of created something like a really interesting theory of consciousness called integrated world model theory, which is essentially integrating aspects of predictive processing theory and combining it with the global workspace theory in a kind of sense that I alluded to about sharing of information at the center of the ring and actually also combining it with areas at the back of the brain in IIT terms, right? And so actually integrating it in. And basically what you're seeing is the kind of maneuvering in the field where people think ah, we're kind of grappling towards a predictive processing theory of consciousness it's not yet clear it's not like 20 years old like uh or 20 30 years old like global workspace theory or iot or something ten, you know it's we're right at the beginnings of this i predict that we will have a you know a theory of consciousness based around predictive processing i also predict that people will say that's not a theory just like people say other theories in our theory, you know, and there'll be lots of argument and there'll be, you know, and I think that will be a richer process for thinking about consciousness because actually I'm kind of partial to the view that, you know, recurrent processing theories, IIT theories, global workspace theories, higher order theories, and predictive processing theories are all bringing something important to the table. And actually at, a at uh, ASSE, which is the main consciousness conference last year, um, there was a debate in that whole thing between these four theories. And there was supposed to be a fifth theory, except that Anil Seth had long COVID, so he couldn't come. But, you know, there were five theories that were put up for debate. So good question, but, you know, see the messy process of science in front of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just really confused. It's like, for example, even a new says, like at the Wayne Pan paper, he just say one thing. Oh, productivity is just a framework, not a theory. But at the same time, you, you can also see his reviews in Nature Reviews, uh, Neuroscience lately, like a serious consciousness is still listed as one of the theory, and he is in participant. But if you know that it's not a theory, why do you still participate in the adversarial collaboration in testing it as a theory of consciousness? I just, you know, I just don't get it. Oh, yeah. Also, like it's 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 wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful and nuanced, and in that nuance, we might get progress. <laughs> Unfortunately, at the cutting edge, science is always confusing. You know, literally everyone at the conference last uh, week was confused, and that was a sign of progress. 
<laughs> Thank you. Any more? We have time for one more. Where's the timekeepers? Anyone? Yeah. And and uh, you know, I think the tutors should feel free to, to, to ask questions as well. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, because actually the free energy principle also tries to explain more than just the brain, right? Um, so it's more or less a theory of everything. So how is your take on that? Like what can predictive processing tell us more than about the brain? Okay, great. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I didn't bring that out, but thank you for asking a question on that. So Carl Friston often says that there are two ways into the free energy principle. One is the low road and one is the high road. And I took the low road, which is through um, inference. Uh, uh, and then there's another road, which is called the high road, which is based around um, the concept of Markov blankets. And Markov blankets are essentially, think of them like, um, like, informational boundaries like for example a cell membrane for a cell um, that all information has to go through the cell membrane and so if you look at the informational states of the cell membrane you will get that all the information inside will that has come from outside will have to have been represented on the on the blanket states on the on the mark of blanket states now it's it's essentially saying that if you have a Markov blanket, then you are going to be instantiating a model of the external data, and this is very powerful. And this, you know, the the, the sort of principled information theoretic arguments that have been proofs that have been trying to be given for this, and this means that. Everywhere you see a Markov blanket, not just in the brain, but in the body, perhaps in the organs, perhaps in the cells, perhaps ecosystems, perhaps the planet Earth, you know, I mean, even species, I mean, you know, even, you know, within in the in the evolutionary tree and the species and things like that, you know, you're going to see this kind of what um uh, is called in the in the area bayesian mechanics um and i think it's a wonderful idea it's a very powerful um idea you know and um it's very evocative so yeah just the, that's a brief glimpse um of of how that is and i could just focus on the brain okay, that's a very quick follow yeah, but right. there is uh, is there a way to detect a mark of blanket? Like when you see something, you're like, okay, this is a mark of blanket, and this is not one, or is that just like you could that, basically see them everywhere depending on your definition? Or yeah, no, that's that's a very good question. To be honest, I think most mark of blankets are only approximate, and I, and that's an issue um, in theory. But but you basically have to see. So the canonical example would be some sort of system that is autopoetic and self-organizing and, and continuing through time. So if a system exists, so this is how the, I'm sketching a little bit how the proof works. If a system exists, the nature of existence is that it's a system for itself, which means that there is a Markov blanket. So just to call it the, that there exists a system, is sort of saying that we can define a system, self-contained kind of system like this, which means that the fact that it's self-contained in this way means that it's got a Markov blanket. So it's a great question uh, because, um, because it, it, you know, this stuff is very powerful. I mean, there was a paper written a couple of years ago, which was saying a general theory of everything, every da uh, space thing. And by Carl Frister, like the thing was things that exist. I mean, it was really deep stuff. And anything that exists, exists for itself, has a Markov blanket, because that's what it means that it persists through time. And one of the, just just, just very quickly, because it's, it's kind of a cool thing, if it persists through time as a system, one of the things that it must be doing is also, in practice, not being broken down by entropy, surviving against the, sec the threat of the second law. Uh, uh, unless it's thermodynamic entropy. And so a system 
has a model of its external environment in order, and, and acts in such a way as to avoid the second law. So this is a sort of interesting argument to say that things like homeostasis and action are, are, are ways of instantiating active inference um, in order to, or as a result, they it means the system continues to exist, which is resists the second law of thermodynamics. Very interesting, thank you. <laughs> so now that we have applied free energy to every space thing, uh, I think we can finish here. Thank you very much, Emil, for the amazing talk. And uh, yep. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, and good luck for the rest of this workshop.